Everyone, welcome back. Uh, next up, we've got Chris Peruna, uh, growth stock investor and real estate professional. And he'll be talking about a topic that I'm sure is applicable to many of you, how to invest while working full time. So uh, Chris, take it away. And, and yeah, looking forward to this. Thank you, Richard. Pleasure to be back with you on Twitter, on uh, YouTube, Zoom. Uh, yeah, so I basically want to I want to kind of dive into this more from a high level perspective. I'm not going to drill down into the detail of exactly what I do when I'm chasing a stock or getting into a stock, getting out of a stock. I really want to put an agenda together, just how to invest while you're working full time. And I think a lot of my followers, I think a lot of folks out there on Twitter, aside from maybe the 5% that do this full time for a living or work in that Wall Street financial environment, they're, they're doing something else, whether it's working a job, running a business, whatever it may be, they want to invest. They don't just want to do index funds, ETFs, mutual funds. They actually want to go out there and invest and, and do something more from a growth standpoint. So I figured it'd be kind of interesting and a little bit cool to kind of just jump into what it, what it means for me. I've been doing this for 23 years and how you can actually do it full time with only a few hours a week and kind of put it together. So let's uh, jump right into it. Perfect. So the first thing I want to do is kind of just get like the about me as far as who am I, where do I come from and why am I qualified to even talk about this? So real quickly, I was born and raised in New York. I'm currently living in New Jersey. I've got a wife and two kids. I obtained my degree in architecture back in the late 90s. I entered college in 96. I actually started investing in 99, a couple of years into college. And I practiced for about seven years, primarily focused in on historic preservation. Uh, my background spans the overall real estate market, more from a commercial standpoint. I don't do residential real estate. I'm an owner's rep, I'm a project manager, and I'm also responsible in SVP and a small firm to do the business development here in the tri-state region for what I'm doing with a lot of my corporate clients. So what, what is my experience? Like I said, it's not residential. It's, it's really interior commercial and core and shell built to suit projects. So I'm working with a lot of Fortune 500 companies. I'm working with a lot of private entities that aren't public. And I've managed a little bit over 3 million square feet over the last decade or so with a value of $750 million. And, and, and I've worked with clients in various industries from pharmaceutical to healthcare, to financial, professional services. And the average size of a project that I manage, my team manages and our firm manages can go anywhere from 5,000 square feet to uh, a half million square feet to a million square feet or more if it's a large corporate end, uh, headquarters. Uh, one project we're working on right now in Cleveland, Ohio, I mean, it's a million and a half square feet corporate headquarters for a major Fortune 500 company. And the capital expenditure that a lot of these firms will spend on some of these bid outs will start with a million dollars and they'll go up to a hundred million dollars or more for any particular project. Some notable clients that I've worked on are L'Oreal, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, Johnson & Johnson, BMS, MetLife, NYU, I worked on public projects like the New York Public Library and, and so on and so forth. What's really interesting, and I think which kind of ties in really well with what I do with investing, is I get to work with these clients from inception as they start to build their companies and their young companies and they're building new headquarters and they're expanding upon their footprint, both across the country and around the world. Take over General Pharmaceuticals. I pitched that job with my firm back in 2009 and we got awarded for the project. And then I started working on that campus full-time three days a week as a consultant in 2010. At the time, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals were trading about $22 to $25 per share. Now, we put together a master plan for the client. They had three buildings on site. where we going to expand upon that and, and move from three buildings to maybe six to eight buildings over time as they were developing this brand new pharmaceutical drug called, drug called ILEA, which was uh, the treatment of macular degeneration, but in a non-invasive way. And it was supposed to be this new revolutionary type drug coming out of Regeneron. So I got to see kind of how they were building the master plan, how they were growing as a firm and how they're going to kind of bring this drug to market. And over the next six years, as I worked on that campus and we worked on over half a million square feet and well over hundred million dollars worth of real estate, that stock went from $25 a share to over $600 a share. Um, a similar client of mine was Gartner, same thing, uh, ticker symbols IT. When I first started there, I think that stock was trading around 20 bucks a share. Now it's well over hundred dollars a share. So the stock has gone up five or six or seven X from the time when I worked with them over a five or six year period as well. And I worked with them with their headquarters in Stanford, Connecticut. I did some offices for them in New York City. And then I also took two buildings out of the ground for them in Fort Myers, Florida. And I flew down to Florida once a month for three years straight working with that client. So I get to see a lot of unique perspectives from a lot of these companies that do trade publicly. And again, as well, some of these, these companies that are private as well. And it just gets me really excited to kind of integrate the, the financial stock market and a lot of my big clients that are doing stuff that I get to see firsthand. Now, in some cases, I may have to sign a certain NDA or I can't trade in the stock or I have to disclose if I'm going to trade in the stock because I'm privy to some information that the, the overall market might not be privy to as we're kind of taking that job from very early programmatic stages into design phases and eventually into construction. 
and then ultimately we'll 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 close it out and the folks will move into the space itself so it's it's exciting to kind of take that commercial real estate entity and kind of wrap it into the investment world um as far as investments concerned as i mentioned a little bit earlier i started in 1998 um i was two years into college at the time uh, i was studying for my architecture degree and uh, my father got me invested uh, involved into the market i opened up an ameritrade account and it was the late 1990s was the dot-com boom and and i was hooked from there and i never really looked back so uh I got to kind of take you through the journey of how I've maintained a full-time career over the last 20 so odd years. And I've continued to invest fairly successfully over the last 23 years or so. And Chris, uh, I thought it was interesting when we, when we spoke previously at the beginning, um, you were more of a swing trader, position trader. And it, it seems like as you've become more experienced, especially now that you're working full-time, you've kind of lengthened your time frame a little bit. Is that, is that true? hundred percent true. I definitely was very short term anywhere from days to weeks when I first started and then that kind of gravitated from weeks to, to maybe a couple months. And now I'm trying to do from a couple months to a couple of years in that growth portfolio. Um, as we go through the agenda here, one of the sections I have is on risk and account management and I get into diversification. Perfect. As I've gotten older and as I've, I've started a family and I've grown my family, I've kind of diversified my funds. And I'd say the majority of my money at this time are in accounts that really aren't very active. It's the growth account that's active. And that's the one I cover the most um, that's on Twitter. And, and, and that's the one that, that I seem... I always say investing should be boring, but it's the one that excites me the most because I get to go out there and find those young, innovative growth companies. And I'm a little bit more active in that account. But most of my other accounts, I mean, they're very long term. I'm holding stuff in there for years, whether it be mutual funds in the 401k, whether it's uh, the index funds for my children, um, or it's just long term holdings like some of the FANG stocks and some of your traditional stocks like a J&J &J yeah. that are just in my IRA at this point. So, yeah, I've definitely moved from a, a little bit of a shorter term to a longer term investor over the last 20 years. And I think as I continue to get older, I think it will become longer and longer term as time goes by. Now, with that said, and, and, and me being a Canslim guy at, at, at the root of everything, and a lot of folks that are presented here in your conference, and you guys have done a wonderful job, job with this <laughs> list of folks here, um, a lot of them have that Canslim foundation and background, is what I've seen in the last 12 to 18 months is, is maybe sometimes you have to cut your losses a little bit quicker. And, and maybe I have to revisit what I was doing a little bit earlier on in my investing career, um, so I don't have to take some of these large drawdowns and some of these young innovative growth stocks and then look for more opportune times to get back into those stocks going forward. So it's still something you work out. And, and we talked about this on our last interview. It's, it's one of those things you just you, you're constantly learning time and time again of, of what makes sense, lessons learned um, and how you can perform better over time. So I think in the growth account, I might revisit some of that stuff or maybe it's not as long term as I want it to be. And I'll keep that to the other accounts. Um, but it's 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 iterative over time. And, and I'm just still trying to learn myself and. And now being in my young 40s, I, I've got another at least 25 years, hopefully not been wood to do this. So I just want to continue to learn and continue to prove upon what I've done so far. Um, so with that said, what I've done with the agenda, I, I've, I've basically broken this down into four major section and then one closing section. So the first section is going to be successful invest and where I'm going to focus on education, psychology and some general rules. Then we'll get into some fundamentals and technicals. Again, I'm not going to drill down very deep. I'm going to keep it at a 30,000 foot level and go into the essentials of fundamental analysis of which I use. Some of the technical analysis I think is very important, and, and that's the combination of that canceling foundation using the fundamentals and the technicals. And then the new high, new low ratio, which is more of a macro technical analysis tool that I use, um, more from a month-to-month -month and year-to-year -year basis to give me those major turning points in the market, some of those tipping points where you want to back up the truck and really start to invest heavily. Uh, from there, I'm going to get into the screen and how I screen for stocks, some of the most popular screens that I use. And then as you kind of narrow that list of thousands of stocks down to hundreds of stocks, how you go from screens to a watch list. So I'll show you how I kind of take those screens that I build, come up with a number of different stocks each night across those screens, and then build it into a watch list of anywhere from 10 to 50 stocks that makes sense for me at that time. And then lastly, which most might be the one of the most important things is the money management of, of how you kind of tie it all together. So I'll speak a little bit about position size and expectancy, and then going into those diversification of accounts. And then I'll wrap everything up with 10 steps to profitable investing and kind of just close it all out from that standpoint. All right, so I guess we'll jump right in. So everything starts with education. No matter what you do in life, whether you're an architect, whether you're in a different field, sales, um, advertising, stock market, you, you have to start with education. So the key thing I, I saw here, and one of the things I learned after getting invested in the market back in, in late 1990s and having my account go multiple fold and then actually drawn back down almost to the original number again, was what am I doing? What's going on? So I, I've kind of put together a list of, of books that I've read from folks that have been there before me and have done this really well and just learned what works, what doesn't work. And I highlight two books on this slide. One is How to Make Money in Stocks by William O'Neill, which really is the foundation of that cancel system. He invented it. 
It's the foundation of my system. And this is the number one recommended book that I give to anyone that really wants to learn about the market because it gets them started on fundamentals, gets them started on technicals and just understanding some of the psychology of what's going on in the market. The second book that I really recommend to everyone is Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. It's not a how-to book, but it's just one of the best stories ever written about the stock market itself. As you go down the list of books that I have on this slide, and I recommend all these books, as well as many other books that I, that I talk about on Twitter or on my blog, but this is really the dozen or so books that I recommend to everybody, is most of these were written in, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and, and maybe 80s and 90s. Not to say there's not great books that haven't been written here in the 2000s, but a lot of it just regurgitates a lot of, of what was kind of stood the test of time from these books from the 1900s that I've, I've just grabbed so much great information out of um, over the years. So anyone starting out or anyone that's even just been doing this for a, a, a really long time is jump into these books and just learn, highlight them, read them, reread them, take notes. And then as you start to trade, that's where the real education starts is when you actually get active in the market itself is understand what works and what doesn't work and then refer back to these books. I refer back to these books all the time, kind of as a prop right behind me. I have a couple of them kind of sitting on the desk there. It's just it's books I refer to at all times, depending on what's going on in the market, just kind of reread and just, just kind of get my mind going again as far as stuff I learned maybe 15, 20 years ago I read in the book and just kind of want to kind of get back in tune to what, what worked and maybe I've forgotten because we're always caught up with so much noise that's happened from day to day. And three, three famous quotes that I just wanted to point out that, that come from these books. One is from William O'Neill is, what seems too high and risky to the majority generally goes higher. What seems low and cheap generally goes lower. One of my models, and I talked about this in the last slide, is I'm looking to buy stocks off the new highs list or stocks that are very close to those new highs, maybe form a new base. I never go shopping on the new lows list. I mean, I, re I just never do. I know a lot of folks like to kind of pick out some bargains, stuff like that. Stuff is usually priced low for a reason. It's, it's if you're buying art, you're buying a watch, whatever you're buying out in the market, stuff that's priced cheaply is usually because it's cheap. So I don't go there. So I love that quote, quote from uh, Bill O'Neill. Jesse Livermore, who what reminiscence of a stock operator has written about, says the obvious rarely happens, the unexpected constantly occurs. And I think anyone that's been in the market in the last uh, 18 months definitely has seen this, is so much unexpected has occurred in the last year and a half. If it seems obvious and the entire crowd is starting to lean in one direction of what they think is going to happen, that's probably not going to happen. Um, and, and that's something that's hold true that I've seen over the last 23 years time and time again. And the last one's from Bernard Baruch, and it says a speculator is a man, in current day is a person, who observes the future and acts before it occurs. I mean, that's the basis of everything we do as investors is we're looking for these young growth innovative companies and we're looking for these mac macro trends that are gonna start to form over time and we need to act before it occurs. And, uh, and, and, and that's what we're doing as we kind of invest in stocks is we're trying to get ahead of what we think is gonna be in the future. And that's what the market really trades on. It, it trades on future expectations of what's gonna happen. So psychology of investing in general rules. Biggest thing that, that I've learned, the biggest thing I, I suggest to anyone that's new in the market is you really have to understand you. If there's one holy grail of the overall market, it's truly understand who you are. What's your personality? What influences your decisions? What's your lifestyle? Why you invest? And you have to kind of answer these first four questions. And there's probably another dozen or so questions beyond this. But if you don't truly understand who you are, what your personality is, do you have a family? Are you single? Are you traveling? Um, do you like to gamble? Do you like action? Um, are you very conservative with your money? You have to truly write that down, understand who you are, and then you're going to start to develop a system that works for you. So as you build your education, read those books, if you seek out a mentor, and I think with FinTwit, a lot of folks can seek out mentors. They can go to certain subscription services, education services. Uh, Trade Alliance obviously has one of these. And just start to understand who you are. And once you start to understand who you are, then you can build that system that works for you. And a couple of key things as you build that system is you're gonna to wanna to preserve your capital, consistent profitability, you wanna cut your losses short and you want superior returns. Now, some of this might sound like it contradicts what a lot of us do and even maybe what I do online. And as you kind of, kind of morph over your career, some of these things are more important at one time or the other, but cutting more losses short is still very important. Although I may hold losses longer or, or, or drawdowns longer than what a can slim um, rule actually says. So if it says cut your loss at 8% or 7% or 10%, I may hold stocks that are down 20, 25, 30% because I might have a lot of conviction in that stock. And my overall conviction is a longer term viewpoint. So you just have to build that system for you. A system that you build for you is not gonna be for somebody else. You can't copy someone else's system and you can't copy someone else's conviction. You have to build yourself based on your own experiences in the market yourself. And one great quote from Martin Schwartz says, you have to master your ego and realize that being profitable is more important than being right. And I'm gonna reiterate this later as well. Is, a lot of folks, whether they're on FinTwit or not, just want to be right. The market's not about being right. The market's about being profitable. 
And if you actually invest or trade, depending on whatever your system is, if you're a day trader, a swing trader, uh, a position trader, trend trader, or you're just a buy and hold investor, you just have to know you're going to have losses and you're going to make wrong decisions. If I put a list together every year and say, these are the trends I think are going to be great for the next 12 months or the next several years, and I put 20 stocks in that list, there's a good chance half of those won't work out. It's just, it is what it is. But if you can capitalize on the few that you get really right and then cut those other ones that you get wrong, you're going to be very profitable for a very long time. And you can truly beat the market averages over the course of a 10 or 20 year period. Um, one thing I also say every year when I write one blog post to a lot of the followers that I have is if you're working full time and you don't have enough time or you don't really have the love and the, the, the enjoyment to do what we're doing here at investment, 95 percent of those folks should probably just invest in mutual funds or index funds or ETFs and, and really just. Just avoid trading individual stocks. If you want to buy a couple of the fang, st fang stocks or some of the really popular stocks that you just know or maybe a company you work for, go for that. But I, I wouldn't really advise trading in and out of those stocks at this point. I would just say, go to your long-term stuff, dollar cost average, and then look back at it 30 years from now and, and, you, and you'll do fine. So as we jump into the essentials of fundamental analysis, there's two main things that I look at. And I did put a quote at the bottom of the page and William O'Neill talks about the best stocks that are out there really focus on the best quarterly and annual earnings. And I truly believe that. And it's what I've seen. It's, 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 it's what history shows us. You can look at return on equity. You can look at profit margins, sales growth, cash, cash flows, net income. There's a lot of other things that I do look at when I'm looking at a stock, but there's really only two that I focus on the most, and that's earnings per share and sales and revenue. In the top right-hand corner of this slide, I put a little snapshot of the EPS and the sales from Roku. So if you look, there's, there's a couple of things I want to see. I want to see a change in the percentage change in the last quarter's EPS versus the same quarter in the prior year, I want to see a jump of at least 25%. I also want to see the estimate going forward, an increase of at least 25% versus the current year. And then you want to see the past several quarters, you want to see stuff going up uh, anywhere from 25% to as much as 100, 150% or above, and then the last several years. Now, if you look at this example I have for Roku, you could see back in 2019, it was negative. The EPS was negative at the time. What you want to see is those estimates looking forward start to go from negative to positive. These are some of the most powerful stocks that you can see in the market from a growth perspective. The stocks that are going to go up 2x, 5x, 10x over time because they're going from an unprofitable young IPO company into a powerhouse company that they're either their products or services are being used by the masses and they're starting to become profitable and earnings are going profitable. So I really try to highlight within a lot of my screens, which we'll get into a little bit later, uh, stocks that actually might be negative from an EPS standpoint, but they're just blowing it out with the sales, which is on the right-hand side of this little graphic, which shows they went from $250 million of sales in one quarter in 2019 to 500 to $600 million just seven or eight quarters later. And you can see the growth is averaging anywhere from 49% to 42% to 79% over those eight quarters. That's a powerful growth stock. And anyone that, that owns or knows Roku, I mean, we've seen the stock pretty much go up 10x over the last few years. And, uh, and that's what we're really focused on. So earnings per share is number one. And, and the same rules really apply to the sales and revenue. I'm looking for those same percentage changes, Q over Q, year over year, and those estimates as they flow forward. And I shared another graphic here from Investopedia. Essentially, and Bill O'Neill says this and several other people prior to us have said this, is as earnings grow Q over Q and year over year, if price isn't following it in the short term, ultimately price will follow it over the long term. And you're probably in a really good stock at that point. So if sales are going up Q over Q, at least 25%. Earnings are going up Q over Q, at least 25%. That price will follow those earnings and will follow that sale, those sales numbers over time. So if there are some drawdowns, and this is where I deviate a little bit from the canceling rules, I will hold the stock like a Roku that went down 30% last year during 2020. And I held it. I bought it at 133. It went down to the low 100s. Um, and it was a tough one to kind of swallow. It. And, and I was at a decision point if I was going to hold it or, 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 or just cut it loose at that point. I decided to hold and it's worked out really well. It doesn't happen every time, but you have conviction. And if you look at those numbers that are in this chart here on the right, typically price will catch up and follow what's going on with EPS and what's going on with sales. And in this situation like Roku, do you practice any system to hedge your position or, or, um, or do you just hold it and, and, and wait for the trend to continue so I, upwards? I, I mostly hold it. Um, what I've done in the past, past, I say six months or so, especially when February and March hit this year, there's a few stocks that I own uh, Square, Pinterest, I actually reduced the position sizes. So I, I, I kind of hedged it with the position size just so I felt more comfortable at night saying, all right, the market's going through a correction right now. I do have a lot of conviction in these stocks. I don't want to sell them completely, but they're all right. pulling back at this point. I'm going to just reduce the position size and I can always get back into it and add more shares to the stock. So I've tried hedging techniques in the past. It hasn't worked out very well for me. 
Um, mm -hmm. I've tried uh, 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 buying put options, sell inputs, sell and calls, things along those lines. And, and I'm always testing them out. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. I found for me, the best is just kind of cash, roll it up into cash, sit on the sidelines, see what's going on with the trend overall, and then just get back into those stocks. Certainly there's tax implications to that because if you have something that's a short-term capital gain and you're holding something long-term, yeah. you're going to have to deal with that on an annual basis with, with the tax man. Um, so it's, it's one of those things you have to take into consideration as an investor, what makes sense to you, understanding if, if you truly just want to hold it and, and, and you're going to withstand that drawdown, you have conviction, then maybe it's best not to sell and just stay in the stock at that point. I trim one when I think the market's going against me and I trim two when a position gets too large. So mm -hmm. if a position starts to get above that 15%, um, holding within my portfolio, I'll start to trim back a little bit and get it back down to that eight to ten percent, and then hope, hoping it's still going to grow from that point. And then hoping I'll have to trim it again um, at some time in the future. I think some of the great professional investors of our time, whether it be Druckett Miller or Soros, and just recently in an interview they talked about high concentration and in, in their most um, convicted stocks or positions, and and I think that's true. But those those folks are outliers. I'd say ninety nine point nine percent of the folks in the world can't really trade as successful as those folks do. So. I diversify a little bit more and I'll actually raise the cash and then I'll just get back into the position going forward. Perfect. And there's a question here. I don't know if you'll get to it when you're, when you're screening, but they're asking if you take into account price to sales ratio, PE ratio, all, all those different things and, and valuation in general. So for growth stocks, I don't, because um, some of the growth, best growth stocks, and if you look at, if you go back into that, how to make money in stock from Bill O'Neill, he'll show you some of the best growth stocks going back 40, 50 years and, and right up to today. As they grow, and if a stock runs from twenty dollars a share to two or three hundred dollars a share, that PE ratio is kind of probably going to grow three x, four x, five x over that same period of time. So I, I discount that. I don't look at PE ratios. Um, I don't really look at book values. Valuations in the last year have been crazy on a lot of these stocks, but I've, I've noticed. I missed Zoom originally because I thought it was too highly valued when it was trading below hundred dollars a share, and little did I know it was going to run up to five hundred dollars a share at the time. I then subsequently bought after that, and some still argue it's still highly valued at this point. But when you're looking at a a growth stock that has an innovative technology or product or service, you have to give it room in the first five or six years. And, and you kind of put that stuff aside. Once that stock matures and starts to establish itself, I think those ratios start to come into play at that point in time, right. but not when they're young in, in, in their investment life or they're new to, new to the, uh, the Wall Street game. So no, I, I don't look at that stuff. And we've got a question that just came in um, from, uh, from Boxcars. So if you trim your holdings over 15%, how many positions do you hold when fully invested? And uh, if you use margin uh, with leverage? So I don't use margin. I don't use leverage in, in, in that growth account at all. Um, the way I would say I leverage some of my positions is I'll sell out of the actual stock position and then go buy call options, more leap type options. So I did yeah. that with SoFi recently. I owned it. It was volatile. I was a little shaky on it, but I still liked it. I said, you know what? I'm going to sell my shares, take that cash off the table, put a much lower amount of cash up front, buy a number of call options that will control the same number of shares that I really want to own, and then buy them out in the future, at least a year ahead. And that's what I did there. So that's the only way I'll really leverage that account. I, I won't go on margin. And then position size or, or number of positions. In the last year or so, I've been hovering right around 15 positions or so within that growth portfolio. I've always said, and I said this in our interview a number of months ago, Richard, I, I really like to keep that down near 10 to 12. Yeah. Um, there are so many great innovative companies out there and, and, and you have this, just not say, I want to own them all. You can't own them all, but there's always that other two or three stocks I just want to own. So I've, I've kept it near 15 recently. It should be a little bit less than that, but I, I think 15 has been comfortable for me in the last couple of years. I try not to go above 15 holdings at any given time. And again, because then getting back to that concentration point, now you're getting too diversified within one account. And I think that's actually going to bring your returns down. If, if you have some really highly convicted stocks in the account, if you own 20, 25 stocks, how well can you really do? And if you own that many stocks, why don't you just go buy a, a Kathy Wood ETF at that point or, or, or a fund like that? Because if she's going to hold 25 or 30 stocks, let them do the work professionally and just, just, just buy one of their funds. So I think 10 to 15 is ideal for me. Um, Bill O'Neill will say even less. A lot of times they'll say anywhere from uh, maybe three to eight stocks, uh, depending on the size of your account. So it's, it varies. And it, it really goes back to understanding you again, what, what's comfortable for you. For me, I like to hone a little bit more. So I think that 10 to 15 makes sense um, and, and no leverage for me. I'm not against leverage and I think some people use it really well. I just, it's not something for me. It's not something I'd be comfortable with, yeah. especially with volatile growth stocks. I mean, it, it, there's, there's times when you go into earnings, there's times when you go into a weekend and a major event happens, next thing you know, your stock's down 20%. If you're leveraged, that's a, that's a major hit to your portfolio. So I, I avoid that at all costs. Perfect. All right. So we'll jump into uh, master technical analysis. Uh, so what I've done with this, this slide here and, and, 
when you get into fundamental analysis and technical analysis, I could probably spend 45 minutes on each of these topics alone and really drill down. And, and, and some of the other presenters have done some really great jobs kind of highlighting some of their techniques that they use. I could do the same, but I wanted to keep this a little bit more high level. So I stick mostly with candlestick charts. I focus on the daily charts, the weekly charts, and occasionally I'll zoom out to the monthly chart because I just want to get rid of the noise a little bit and just see where the overall trend is more from a longer term perspective. If you get a stock like a Roku, um, if you get a stock like Square, sometimes you just have to zoom out and get rid of that noise on a daily or weekly standpoint just to see if the stock truly is still trending up at any given time. Um, what I look for within the chart itself, so I focus mostly on those daily and weeklies. I'm looking for properly formed bases. One example I have here is the cup with handle, which is one of my favorites. It's one of uh, Bill O'Neill's favorites. Major moving averages, something I talk about uh, ad nauseum is the 200 day moving average or the 40 week on the weekly chart. I love high quality stocks that pull back to that 200 day moving average. Um, and they give you ample opportunity to kind of either get into the stock or add shares to the stock itself. One example I use here is C Limited. As you see back in 2019, you had an opportunity um, in the mid twenties to get back into the stock there after its first run. It made a short second run and then we had COVID. It gave you another opportunity in the mid thirties to get back in. And then it went on its ultimate run to over $260 a share. Um, and then more recently we've seen here in 2021, it's given us another couple of opportunities to kind of get back into that stock. Um, I talk about stage analysis as well. So that's Stan Weinstein, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four analysis. You have to start to determine at some point if a stock like C Limited, it, does it have a runway for the next several years or is it gonna get into a, a, eventually a stage three falling into a stage four? You just have to keep an eye on that. But when it pulls back to that, 40 week moving average and it's trending up, I still think that's a great risk to reward ratio to kind of get into that stock or add shares to it. And uh, that's something that I've done with C Limited over the past years, I've gotten in as it's pulled back. Um, I like to look at relative strength. One example is the Pinterest chart on the bottom right of this slide. And Pinterest last year uh, during COVID went down to $10 a share, it shot back up to the $20 share region. But what was really key to me, and this is something that Kansom really focuses on, and I know some folks at Trade Alliance focus on this is, the relative strength line itself, how is that reacting? So forget about the number, but how is the line actually reacting? So as the stock is starting to increase up, is that relative strength line also increasing up, which is showing that it has more strength than its peers versus over the rest of the market itself. So as I saw Pinterest start to go up, one, I thought it was a good company. Two, I liked the price action. Three, I saw the relative strength rate and went from basically single digits to 79 in a few month period. I jumped into the stock. Some folks might say, well, why would you buy a stock that's up 200% over a few months? I thought it was only just getting started, had a lot more runway. Now in hindsight, we can look back and say, well, it ran for 24 over $80 per share. And that RS line went all the way up to 99, 99 which is the highest rate you can get uh, in Marcus Smith or CanSlim. Um, the stock has pulled back recently and it's trading in the $60 range now, but it's still, it's still a solid stock. But I like to use that relative strength just to see how any particular stock is reacting versus all its peers in the overall universe of stocks itself. Pivot points and breakouts. And then I mentioned the stage analysis. So. One chart I've always used, I, I used this on my blog years ago, so I kind of just dug it back up again, was Domino's Pizza back in 2005. I thought it was just a beautiful cup of handle uh, 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 pattern that it formed at the time. And it just had such a great breakout, had large volume. And it basically mimics that exact graphic that you have on the left-hand side, which comes from Investors Business Daily. Uh, more recently, and you can do this on daily charts, weekly charts, monthly charts. I prefer weekly. That's probably the best to do it. And you want a pattern such as this to kind of form maybe over a two or three month period and then have that handle kind of slide down a lower volume. And then you can either buy a pocket pivot or buy it on the breakout itself. Um, transferring over to other markets, whether it be commodities or crypto, a pattern very similar to this also happened in Bitcoin last year. And I highlighted it all last fall as Bitcoin had a monthly pattern that looked like a couplet handle and it had a, a, a breakout of $12,000 per coin. Ultimately it broke out over that on large volume and that ran to $60,000 per coin. And more recently it's pulled back. So. This pattern can work across all different markets as well, whether it be commodities or stocks or futures or currencies, whatever it may be. Um, I think a lot of these patterns do translate to anything that's investable because it's really the humans that are driving the price action and the volume action. And uh, I think the TA really makes a lot of sense. All right, so this, this slide is about the new high, new low ratio. And I don't know how many people really follow the new highs and new lows, but I really like this as a macro technical analysis tool from a standpoint where it allows you to pull the hood up. If you look at the NASDAQ, the S&P, the Dow Jones, and you look at the indexes, they might tell you what's up, what's down, where's volume, are they, are they in an uptrend, downtrend, whatever it may be. But, but, but the real meat is under the hood. And, and I think those are so heavily weighted these days that they're, they're not great indicators as far as what's going on with the overall market. So you wanna see how many stocks are making new highs, how many stocks are making new lows. Further, 
how many stocks in a particular industry are making new highs? Because that's a strong industry that you really want to pay attention to. And if you find that there's 150 stocks making new highs today and 25 of them are in the one industry, you want to focus on that industry because that's a leading industry at that given time. And recently, it's been energy and oil and gas and things like that. Last year was a lot of the, the SaaS companies and tech companies. You just It tells you where the strength is at any given time. And you want to follow that and then narrow down those industries to maybe the strongest two or three stocks and then buy the top one or two stocks within that industry. That's what the new highs and new lows do. Where I also look at it from a macro standpoint is the extreme readings on the new high and new low ratio when they signal a change in trend. And I use two examples here, and it's all from the same year or same, same trend, is October 2008 and April 2009. And if you look at the chart above, you can see the red lines that kind of came down. We had extreme readings that were well over 1,000 new lows per day. And in October 2008, after a long eight or nine month bear market, we started to get to over 2,000 new lows in any given day. And, and ultimately, that showed you that the, the market was getting exhausted and you were at an extreme point in the market and the bottom was probably near. By 2009, in March, April, you started to see that those pink and red readings, which were extreme readings, started to turn to neutral and eventually blue readings to say, OK, the market has done bottom. We're now going into an uptrend and now you can start to buy stocks again. Um, I look for these extreme readings. We just had one last year in March of 2020. We actually, as you can see, versus 2008 and probably because of SPACs and, and more issues that are listed these days, we had well over 2,000 stocks that were also new lows that we were having at the time. Um, it just gives you that extreme need to say, okay, now's the time to back up the truck. Now's the time to go into your most highly convicted stocks and start to add shares. It's probably the most painful time to add shares at any given time when the market's just getting hammered left and right day after day, week after week. But when the new high, new low gets very extreme, it usually signals a bottom in the market. It's time to get in. And eventually that market will start trending back up again. Um, Ultimately, what the new high, new low differential does, it takes the number of new highs in a given day, number of new lows, and it kind of just subtracts new highs minus new lows, and you get that differential. You want to see a positive in a healthy market. When it's negative, you're in obviously not such a healthy environment. I smooth those lines out with the 10-day average and the 30-day average. Um, when those turn negative, the 10-day and 30-day, that means we're downtrending. It's a little bit of a lagging indicator, but it's one that will get you out before you're really going to hit some major pain. Um, it did it in 87. It did it back in 2000. It did it in 2008. And then on the flip side, as those averages start to turn positive, as you see in that, that slide in, in, in April 2009, the pink starts to turn neutral, and then from neutral, it will start to turn blue. If I fast forwarded some of those data slides to May, you're starting to see regions that are starting to go into light blue and then eventually darker blue to say now you're in a major uptrend at this given time. So you can, you can chart it on, on many different platforms. So I use stockcharts.com, and then I also keep the data myself. So I download the data and actually populate it into an Excel spreadsheet. And then I, I, I do some conditional format just to kind of show me so I can get a quick glance every day. Where is this indicator? Now, I don't really look at this every single day, but I'll look at it from a weekly to a monthly basis, especially when you're starting to see um, distribution days on the overall general indexes. I'll start to look at the new high, new low ratio just to see if it's confirmed the trend at any given time. And we had a great question from Marshall. Um, when the new high divided by new low is that an extreme or bottoming action in, in the market? What's your go-to buy for your long-term accounts or children's accounts? And maybe we'll talk about that later too, but if you have any thoughts. What's a go-to buy? Is that what the question said? Yeah, basically what's your, what's your buy when there's those extreme low readings um, like we so saw should, in, in 2020? Right, so in a growth account, you should have a watch list at any given time. So when you're in a major bear market, you're still going to have relative strength of your strongest stocks. The relative strength readings might still be low, but you're still going to have a group of stocks and a bell curve of who your strongest, who your kind of medium stocks, and then your really perform, poorly performing stocks. You want to focus on the stocks that have the greatest relative strength at the bottom of the market. And as you start to see those extreme readings, those are the stocks you probably want to get most interested in and the stocks that you want to buy at that, that point. They'll most likely be the leaders as that market starts to uptrend. Yeah. Um, if you're in a long-term account and, and you're buying stocks such as McDonald's, Johnson Johnson, um, if you're buying Procter & Gamble, any, anything along those lines, maybe dividend type stocks, when you get to those extreme readings, just add to them. Just, that's where you want to maybe even dollar cost average a little bit heavier at that point because those stocks are also going to be depressed at that time because 75, 80% of all stocks follow the market. Mostly they'll be down. Your Apples, your Facebooks, your Amazons, they're all going to come down. If you look back to last March, you look back to 2008, all your best stocks of the last 20 years, they all came down 30, yeah. 40, 50, 60%. Just add to all those stocks when those extreme readings come up. And, and if you have a long time horizon of, of several years, you're going to be fine, even if the immediate one to two months after those extreme readings are still rocky. And in 2008, coming out of that major bear market, the market stayed rocky from October until about February. So it stayed rocky for a few more months, but the signal came in October when it truly hit the bottom. Now, I know we're looking in hindsight. It's always easier to kind of look back. But in March of 2020, we were getting those same readings. 
I started buying stocks that second and third week of March when I saw those extreme readings, because I just said it, it really can't go much lower at this point. Everything's exhausted itself. So I started buying a lot of those growth stocks at that point, ended up having a really good year because of that. These indicators don't come around very often. If you look at the chart at the top, maybe it's happened five or six times over the last 12, 15 years. So it's, it's one of those couple times a decade that these readings come around. And those are the times you really have to pay attention. Those are the times you really want to load up on your highest condition stocks, whether it's short-term accounts or long-term accounts, for sure. All right. So let's jump into screening for stocks and, and, and how I screen for stocks. I use MarketSmith. Um, I'm not endorsing or I don't get paid by MarketSmith to say I use it. It just seems to be something that works for me. So going back to that first slide, work worked for me. I'm a Canslim guy at the heart of everything. So I, I went to a screening service that really kind of builds proprietary um, ratings in the Canslim methods. So I love their screening tools. There's many screening tools that are out there, whether they're paid, they're free. Just got to find what works for you. I'm able to build my own proprietary screens within the system itself. So I focus on a bunch of different screens. I probably have about a dozen and a half different screens, but there's probably five or six that I really rely on from a, a night to night and week to week basis. Number one is quality stocks making new 52 week highs. And you'll see I mentioned quality stocks several times on the list here. I put a little, a little note down below. It, what I'm saying with by quality is Canson quality. I'm looking for earnings per share of at least 60 or greater or relative price strength rate and RS rating of at least 60 or greater. So what it does, it filters out any stock that has less than a 60 rating from an EPS or an RS rating. Um, if I'm running those screens and I'm not getting a lot of stocks coming back, I'll loosen those parameters up a little bit because maybe the market's a little bit weaker. But when the stock market is strong, you should have plenty of stocks that are making your screens with those ratings from 60 to 99. Now, CanSlim and MarketSmith itself, they rate stocks anywhere from 1 to 99, 99 being the strongest, 1 being the weakest. I'm looking for that top third of the market, the strongest stocks with those two ratings, which go back to my fundamental analysis earlier. So all my fundamentals are built into the screens based off these ratings. So quality stocks making new high, new 52 weeks highs. I'm looking for all the stocks that are making those new highs. They don't have overhead resistance anymore. And I'm looking for the industries that are actually appearing the most within that list of 52 week highs. And those are the companies that you really want to be most interested in. And if you're a shorter term trader, and you're not really trading like I am longer term. These are stocks you want to focus on. These are the stocks you want to trade. Um, whether you're day trading, you're swing trading. These are your most powerful stocks. These are the stocks that can give you those 25 to 50% moves in a several weeks and you can get in and out of them and you, and you can really do well over a short period of time. Um, quality stocks with the new IPO within the past few years, these are your, your powerful new growth stocks that you're looking for. So again, I'm setting certain parameters within the system itself to kind of give me the stocks that just IPO'd in the last few years and are gonna do really well, um, or I think that are gonna do really well based off some new innovative product or technology that they have that's gonna come to the market. I tie into that in institutional sponsorship increasing. And I believe that the screen I have up right here is fund sponsorship, 10% or more, the most recent quarter versus the prior quarter, minimum 100 funds. And I sorted it by that. So if you look at this list, it's shown stocks that had the most institutional sponsorship increase over the last quarter. Um, so I have a couple of stocks that are flagged there and I'll get that in a second. The column on the left shows a couple of these flags that are highlighted. As I run my screens of all these different screens on the left-hand side, I'll start to filter out stocks as I'm looking at the technicals of stocks that interest me at any given time, and I'll flag them. What those flags do is it puts it on a personal watch list, which I'll explain in the next slide. Um, and it starts to kind of filter out the hundreds of stocks that are coming back in these screens, so I can narrow them down to maybe 30 or 40 or 50 stocks that I really want to dive into, which ultimately I'll narrow down to maybe two or three stocks that I'm really interested in buying at any given time. Um, so what I'm, what I'm really looking for is is stocks that continue to make a lot of these different screens, um, quality stocks that are trading within 15% of a 52 week high. So like the first screen, which shows you all the 52 week highs, I'm also looking for stocks that maybe just recently hit a 52 week high. I mean, they pull back for some given reason. Maybe they're at the 50 day moving average. Maybe they're just, they pull back to a support level. Maybe they had a gap up and they're kind of just digesting that high tight flag, whatever it may be, stocks that are very close to their new high, but, but are off it a little bit and maybe ready to kind of power forward again. So I'm, I'm very interested in those stocks. When the market corrects like it has in the last few months, the next screen I call is quality stocks within 10% of the 200-day moving average. I'm looking for stocks that are coming near that 200-day moving average. And when I say 10%, I can filter this for 10% above, 10% below, or both. So I have stocks that are kind of 10% below and above within the same screen itself. And then within there, I'll sort it based on price action. Stocks that are maybe up for the day, stocks that are up on an above average volume, um, stocks that are up based on certain fundamentals. I can use other columns within the screening system, say maybe it's uh, sales that are up the most over the last quarter, whatever it may be. I'm just looking for those stocks that are very close to that 200-day moving average or 40-week on the weekly charts 
and um, are very high quality stocks that are just taking a breather right now. And I want to mark those down. A, do I own them? Do I want to add to them? Or B, do I not own them? But it's stock that maybe I didn't grab initially. And now it's giving me a second chance to get back into that stock. So that's one of my most powerful screens as well. I'll get into sales and earnings screens. I'll get into quality stocks trading between the 50 day and 200 day moving average. And there's many other screens I'll get into. But both me, I think you get the gist of as far as I'm running these screens uh, pretty much every night. Um, and if I don't do them every night, I'm running them every week. And, and just looking for the stocks to consistently make a lot of these screens. And then I start to build my watch list from there. So looking at those flags that I had on the previous screen, this screenshot here basically shows my watch list inside the, uh, the uh, Marcus Smith system. So these are stocks that I have flagged. This is a, a separate now flagged watch list that I have that I can now sort through all the columns, whether I want to look at sales, I want to look at earnings, I want to look at the relative strength rating, I want to look at the number of funds that owned it. I want to look at the number of funds that are increasing Q over Q. Um, this particular one, I have what's called a composite rating that's highlighted. This is a proprietary rating that Cansom uses within MarketSmith that takes a lot of different parameters, kind of groups them all together and comes up with the overall rate of the stock itself. Sometimes I'll just look at that and say, okay, what are the most highly rated stocks that are on my watch list right now? And then I'll click through each one, look at the technicals and say, should I start to buy them? Or I'll filter them and say, okay, have any of them moved up 2% or more on any given day in the last couple of days? Have they moved up 2% or more on volume that's uh, greater than the average by at least 50%? Um, are they making multiple screens every night? Are they making the screens consistently? You don't want those one hit wonders. You want stocks to consistently make a screen over and over again and also make multiple screens over and over again. And that's how it gets on the watch list. Um, and then lastly, I also have a column that I could use that kind of just sorts it by the strongest industry group. So if I have a watch list of 50 stocks, I'll pull up industry groups and then just sort it by industry groups. And if I notice 10 or 12 or 15% of the stocks are within one industry group, that's the industry group I start to focus on that given time and say, okay, maybe I should own one or two stocks within this industry group at this particular time, because this is where the strength of the market is right now. Um, technical criteria as I do these watch lists. And when I'm in the Marcus Smith system, I can click on any one of these stocks and then a, a chart obviously pops open and you can look at daily, weekly. I'm trying to identify the trend. Is it up? Is it down? Is there a base that the stock is forming? Um, is there a pivot point or a breakout area? Has it actually established support or resistance somewhere? And as you start to identify this from a technical standpoint, you use the screens from a fundamental standpoint, and then that gives you the either the yes or no if you want to buy that particular stock. And uh, Chris, we had a question about IPOs. Um, the question is, Chris, some IPOs um, that have earnings or sales potential, but they don't have institutional sponsorship yet. How do you treat that? Um, do you ignore those for the time being? I most, mostly ignore them. Now, I have bought IPOs, the Palantir. There's certain stocks that I just like, maybe the, the management or the ownership, or, or Palantir was a company that my former firm worked with um, as a client on the real estate side. So we got to learn a little bit about the company as we were building one of their headquarters in New York. There's certain companies you just get to learn about where I'm interested in the IPO. Normally, I'll wait for it because what I've also seen with IPOs in the first year or so, a lot of them will maybe make a run and then they'll yeah. make that first natural correction. Um, and all the great ones have pretty much done this. Not every single one, but most of them have done it. I'll usually give it time to kind of build some institutional support, build that first base, and then I'll get into the stock at that point. Um, it's not a hard no. It's not a hard yes. Um, some I will get into. But most of my institutional screens that I run have a minimum of 100 institutions in the stock. Right. I will make exceptions. I mean, I own a couple of stocks. Um, um, uh, SEMA 4, which is CMLF. I mean, I own that. That doesn't have the support yet. If you look at SoFi, I, I want to say maybe it's it's less than 50 funds on that stock at this point. I will make some exceptions if I really like the actual company itself, if I like the management that's behind the company and some of the potential it has. But mostly I'm looking for stocks to get above that 100 institutional funds in the stock and then kind of run from there. I've noticed in my, my 23 years, the stocks that make the greatest runs are the stocks that go from 100 institutions to over 1,000 institutions. Yeah. And if you look at all the great stocks of just even the last few years, and you go back and look at the last eight to 10 quarters, they all made that run from a couple hundred institutions to well over a thousand institutions. And all their stocks have run up 5X, 10X over that time. None of these stocks can really make a great run without the institutional sponsorship. Occasionally you'll get an exception to the rule, maybe like um, like, like uh, UPST or Fiverr last year. I mean, a couple of those didn't have a tremendous amount of institutional support, but they made five to 10X runs. And, and, and that's the retail crowd getting into it. And institutions just really aren't privy to it. But what I think you'll see with a lot of those stocks and you're seeing right now is they're going to correct now. And that's when the institution is going to start to get involved and then you get ready for the next run. And, and the really great stocks will make several runs over a 10 year period. It's not a, a one and done within one or two years. I mean, they're going to make their corrections and they're going to make another run. Look at, look at NVIDIA. I mean, mm -hmm. over the last eight or 10 years, I mean, that stock has made one, I mean, it was trading less than $20 a share in 2015. 
trading over $600 a share now, but it's had some major corrections along the line. Uh, Melly is another stock that I highlight sometimes on Twitter. Uh, another one that's had probably 10 different 30% corrections over the last 10 years, but it's one that had a few hundred, a few hundred institutional investors to now well over a thousand institutional investors. And it's made that great run with the stock as well. So I really want to see the institutions involved. I want to jump on the trends that the institutions involved. They're the ones that are really going to move the stocks at the end of the day sustainably. So you'll mm -hmm. get some stocks out there. Um, and I won't give any names out. I don't want to insult anyone's holdings at this point, but there'll be some stocks that'll make a really great run and go up four or five X. And then they'll really cater on the right side of that, that chart. And then it'll take a long time for them to recover because they don't have the institutional support. Institutions, unless something's really broken or wrong with the stock, they're not going to dump the stock after the run. They might shed some shares, but as that stock starts to correct in the base, more institutions are going to get involved with that stock at that time. Ultimately, that stock's going to make another run going forward. Um, you look at MongoDB, Trade Desk, uh, Coupa, a lot of these great stocks from the last five or six years, Shopify, they've all had some corrections, but they all continuously just get more and more funds kind of pulling into the stock. Take a longer stock like PayPal. PayPal's yeah. probably got about 3,000 institutional holders now, but it's made a great run over the last uh, eight or nine years since its IPO. It has some nice steep corrections. Um, so you just really want to get involved. If it's, if it's making a correction, but the institutional sponsorship is not really going down, it's just staying stable or even edging up, that's a stock that really, in my mind, the light bulb goes off and said, pay attention because it's correcting, but the institutions aren't bailing. And actually more institutions are jumping in. So this is probably a stock that's going to make another run at some point in time. And there's a question earlier about um, whether or not you kind of try to identify macro trends. So longer, longer term trends, and then go down, try to find stocks that fit those trends and then capitalize on that trend. Some, I mean, sometimes I do, I do one post every year on my blog, and it's really only one post I do these days. And I'm looking for macro trends. What's out there? Is it cybersecurity? Is it um, genomics? Is it, is, is it SaaS companies? Whatever it may be, I'm looking for those macro trends and then trying to drill down within those macro trends. What are the hottest industries and what are the hottest stocks within those industries? Um, sometimes, you, like genomics, I, I, I own, it's the first Kathy uh, Wood ETF that I bought was the genomics one. And I've, I've played with a couple of the stocks in there to buy and I've sold them. I was like, you know what? I just don't know enough about genomics at this point in time. I'm just going to own her fund at this point. And over time, I'd like to buy a couple of those individual stocks. Um, so that's how I'm playing that macro trend. But every once in a while, I, I really would like to own maybe one or two of the leaders within that group because I think it could out, far outperform what that fund's doing and what the overall indexes are doing as well. Right. All right. So this slide might be the most important slide that's out there. Uh, it could be one of the most intimidating or, or boring slides that are out there for most folks, but it's the money management and what it comes down to. And I've separated this into two categories, one being position size and one being expectancy. Position size is the most important. And truly, what does position size mean? It just means know how much money you can trade on each position. I don't care if you're a day trader um, or you're a buy and hold trader or investor, you just have to know how much money you can trade on each position. So ultimately, you never exceed your max risk. You don't want the potential blow up of an account. You need to know what your account size is. You have to know how much available funds you have. And it helps you determine what your maximum um, risk per position can be. So I've used a calculator and I got this from um, um, Van Thorpe's book. Basically, what is your, and I use generic numbers here, but what's your portfolio size? How much are you willing to risk on a typical position? What's your stop loss as you, as you come up with that position? And what's the share price? So ultimately it's gonna tell you, okay, if you have a 10% stop loss, you're looking at 1% risk on a $100,000 portfolio, you can enter in 200 shares um, at $50 a share and your position size is gonna be $10,000. Your stop loss is $45. So you have a one R risk within that stock. So it tells you what you can buy. You, you, you can max it out. Now, if you increase that risk to two or 3%, if you increase the stop loss to 15% or you tighten it up, these numbers are going to start to fluctuate within the calculator. It'll tell you how many shares you can really buy. And it'll give you that position size. Ultimately, you don't want to risk more than one, 2%, one to 2% on any given position from a loss standpoint. So I'm not saying one or 2% of the hundred thousand, obviously 10% is a lot more than 1% of the hundred thousand. We're saying the risk is 1% in the position. So that's the loss which gives you that stop loss at $45. And then further built into the calculator that I have on Excel, an Excel sheet, and you can get this off my blog, um, or I could always put a link out there on, on Twitter to kind of download this Excel sheet. Um, your retracement stop protection. So as the stock goes up 20% or 30% or 40%, where are your retracement stops at any given point and how much are you gonna gain if it kind of pulls back to that retracement? So if a stock goes up 30% and you have retracement stop of roughly $3.75 from that point, you're going to lock in a 23% gain if it retraces from that 30% gain. Um, and, you, and you can tweak these numbers. These are just very generic at this point in time. But ultimately, the ultimate lesson here is how much you can trade on each position. 
And as I have those 10 to 15 positions in my growth account, I'm really positioning them anywhere from several percent upwards of 10% over those 10 or 15 positions. So no one position can really blow up the account. With that said, though, you have to be careful in some accounts. If you stack your account very heavily to one industry or one sector of growth, if growth gets hit, that entire account's going to come down. Everyone saw in February, March of this year, most growth accounts were down 25 to 30% because if your portfolio was stacked with those growth stocks, ultimately they're all going to fall at the same time. So you have to be careful. You don't want the overall account to blow up either. But if you're in high convicted quality stocks, you're going to go through the drawdown and over time, you'll come back up. So if you're a true trend trader, um, you have to withstand sometimes those drawdowns and eventually those stocks will come back. My personal portfolio right now in growth has now come back to the positive side. Um, from its peak in February, the, the, the overall count came down more than 20%. Um, now I did move to more cash and I hedged some of the max drawdown that I could have had had I just stayed in all the stocks that I own, but ultimately the stock did take a large drawdown and now we're back into positive territory and I'm hoping the rest of the year is going to be positive and we can ultimately beat the indexes. I mean, that's the ultimate goal is I want that account to beat the indexes. It's the only point I have an active account is to do better than what those indexes are doing over time. Second piece of this is expectancy. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but if you're a short term trader, um, this applies to you more than if you're a longer term discretionary trader, but it really is just going to tell you the reliability of your system, percentage of the time that you're going to make money, size of your profits versus the size of your losses, the cost of making a trade, which nowadays is kind of negligible, and then the opportunity to trade. So ultimately what you're trying to look for is how many trades can you make on any given week, any given month, any given year, and then how often or how much is your probability of a win versus the average size of a win, and you're going to subtract the uh, probability of your loss times your average loss. And if you don't come out with a positive expectancy, then you have a system that's not going to work. You want to have a system that comes out with a positive expectancy, and you're going to know how many trades you can make per month or per year. And if you have an account generically at $100,000, and you can make five trades per month, 12 months per year, and you can average 5% expectancy or roughly $500 profit per trade. Again, some trades might give you a $5,000 profit. Some trades might lose you $500, whatever it be, but the average is $500. Over the course of the year, you have a $30,000 profit potential or 30% return on, on your account based on your expectancy. Now, again, you have to be a little bit more systematic or programmatic in trading to really get an expectancy to work. If you're discretionary like me, expectancy doesn't really work that well anymore. Um, but if you're a short-term trader, I think expectancy is, something that, expectancy is something you really want to dive into and truly understand. And it will show you how profitable you can be over the course of a year. So when you go into the year, you should know based on your system, if I can make X number of trades and I stick to my rules, I should come out at this percentage. Um, where are you going to make those trades and which ones are successful? You'll never know. But ultimately, if you have enough opportunity, the numbers should work out over time. And Van Thorpe has a great book and he really drills down into this and dives into expectancy. It's, it's a great one to follow if you're a short-term trader. How are we doing on uh, time, Richard? Uh, we're, do we're doing fine. Okay, All perfect. You. All right, so diversification of accounts. Now, in the interview you did with me, Richard, early in the year, it was the first time I really kind of dove into some of my other accounts or kind of just even highlighted them. I mostly 98, 99% of the time really only talk about my growth account on Twitter. Um, it's, it's, it's mostly the one that, that folks are interested in, um, has a lot of activity. Um, I'm a little more active in it, although I'm not a day trader, but it's, it's one that I'm trading a little bit more active. So it, it makes sense to talk about that one. Um, however, following your interview, I did get a lot of interest in what I'm doing in some of my other accounts. So I've talked about it a little bit more, but haven't fully gotten into it. But I wanted to kind of just dive into what I see myself. And again, this is focused on you, what works for you, because I don't do this for a living and I don't derive any of my income from any of these accounts. I don't need any of these accounts to give me income to live. My income comes from outside the market, um, whether it's through jobs, whether it's through our real estate, rental properties. We don't make income from, from the stock market. We have our long-term accounts, which are our 401ks. My wife and I both have one. We have our IRA portfolio, which has some of our long-term holdings. Uh, which are individual stocks. And we have roughly 20 stocks in that account. We have the active growth portfolio, which I talk about heavily, which is roughly 10 to 15 stocks in that account. I have an alternative portfolio or alternative investments in crypto at this time. I don't really invest in commodities, but, but crypto, whether it be Bitcoin or Ethereum, I have investments there as well. And I'm using that more as an asymmetric type portfolio or a hedge against some of the other stuff that I'm doing. And then we're fortunate enough to have a company, one of our companies that we work for issues company stock. So we have company issued stock. We hold that in a long-term account um, that's, that's separate that we really don't trade actively. We keep that stock there. Other folks might have REITs or, or dividend stocks or whatever it may be. So that could be a whole other portfolio you diversify into. And then both of our kids, we have index funds for. So after both our kids were born, we open up an index fund for each of them. And then we put money into those accounts every year. And we kind of weigh that out. If you go through the five or six different categories that I have where our money is kind of allocated from a liquid standpoint, 
more than half of our money is in non-active accounts. Our active growth portfolio is really only about 25% of our overall investment. So it's one of our, not smallest accounts, but it's a smaller portion of our overall um, inv investment um, um, universe um, that we have. What I did is I took a chart down below, which is one of our uh, retirement accounts. And this is, this is a true chart. I took it out and it basically just says, if you're working full time and you don't have a lot of time to trade professionally, actively day to day, time is where you're gonna grow your wealth. And there's four different lines on this chart. The bottom line is what the employer contributed. The second line is what we as the employee contributed. The, the light blue line is those two numbers put together. That's how much money both us and our employer have put into that account. And the top line is what that account has done over the last 16 years. And this is in a retirement account. There's no individual stocks in this account. This is just trading funds at any given time. Time is where you're going to grow that wealth. If you look at the first six years or so, and again, we had 2008, 2009, which was rough kind of going into that time. It was a 30% drawdown. Now, looking at this chart over 16 years, that blip doesn't look so large anymore. But at the time, that, that, that blip was major. It was over 30% drawdown. Um, as you dollar cost average, you keep putting money into accounts, you're going to grow your accounts well above what the market averages are doing. And this account has performed at um, a little over 11% year over year for the last 16 years. And you can see it's at a new all-time high, including the huge drawdown that we had last March. Um, I made some slight changes in this account where I actually, coming into 2021, I've, I've reduced some exposure on some of the really aggressive high growth funds that we were in and went more back to those traditional S&P 500 FANG type um, um, uh, mutual fund type account, uh, mutual funds. And it counts them really well and, and kind of as growth has been cyclically out of favor at this point, this particular 401k has done really well. The point I'm saying is if you diversify, if you're working full time, put your money and allocate in a couple of different pockets. And I think over time, you're going to do well. And I think whatever count you have, and, and maybe the after count, put that aside, you're going to ultimately have that hockey stick over a 30, 40 year period where it's going to go up. And the next slide, I'm going to show you the Dow Jones over the last 120 years. It literally looks like this chart as well. I mean, the market and the innovation of America and the innovation of just the globe at this point is to go up and to the right. And that's what you want to do. So dollar cost average, always put the money in. Don't start tomorrow, start today and just keep allocating that money. Time flies. I mean, I, I can't believe how old my kids are already. I have a 12 year old. It just, it happens very quickly. And before you know it, you look back and you look at some of these accounts you're like, wow, I can't believe it's grown this much in the last 10 years. And sitting here at 43, I can't imagine what these accounts are gonna look like at 63 if, if I'm lucky enough to make it to 63. But uh, that's how I diversify my accounts. And this is what I recommend to anyone that's working full time. And if you have a 401k at work or if you have a 401k if you're a business owner, and the company's contributing to it, put a minimum match into that 401k. That's free money that's going into that account. And it's free money on top of the money that you're putting in that's eventually going to grow from the market itself. I mean, and, and it's, it's also grown tax-free. I mean, it's, 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 it's a home run to put the money in there. So I, I would advise everyone to do that. Um, index funds are the lowest cost option that are out there. And over a 30-year period, an index fund is usually going to outperform every managed mutual fund in the market um, within a couple percent or so. Um, so I'd say if, if, if you just don't want to be active, just put your money into index funds. If it's if whether it's in a 401k or you're just doing it through an IRA or or directly, um, that's my recommendation for most folks. And then the last slide here, as I mentioned, uh, I just want to say thank you, Richard, to you, to Ross, to Ray, and ultimately to, to anyone that's 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 watching our viewers and, and the participants here. I mean, it, it's we, we couldn't do this without them. So I just want to say thank you to everyone. Thank you for having me here. I mean, the, the list of guests that you've had the last two days is just a extremely impressive list. And like I say, I, I don't work in the financial industry, but I do invest. I think there are a lot of folks out there like me that work full time elsewhere and just want to know how can you invest and, and how can you grow your wealth? Um, everything that I do is really encapsulated in that final quote there. A half hour per night, a few hours on the weekend. It could be either or it doesn't have to be both is really all you need to consistently grow your wealth using these these techniques that I've talked about. As I said, every one of these slides can kind of be drilled down to and probably talked about for at least an hour. Um, but from a very high level, if you can do just this at a minimum and just 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 dedicate an hour or two every week, whether it's broken up or at one time, you certainly can outperform the market or outperform most of your peers um, by investing in those index funds, in those 401ks, and then having an active growth account. So there's really 10 steps to prop profitable trade. I mean, the secret to winning big in the market is not to be right all the time, but to lose the least amount of money possible when you're wrong. That's really the key. You're going to be wrong. Everybody's going to be wrong. Some of the best investors and traders that have ever lived are wrong 50% of the time. Sometimes or sometimes some of them are wrong more than 50% of the time, but but they're multimillionaires, if not billionaires, because they're they capitalize on when they're right and they cut those losses very short. So 
as long as you win larger than you lose, you're going to be profitable at the end of every year. And, and that's the ultimate goal. So there's 10 things you really want to, you really want to focus on. Manage your risk, understand that position size. And I can't emphasize that more. You have to understand your position size and cut your losses, learn when to sell. That might be the most difficult thing on this list other than controlling your emotion is when to sell. Even your winners, sometimes they'll, they'll go from a stage three to a stage four. And you have to know when to sell some stocks. You might own a stock for 10, 12, 15 years. And ultimately, it comes a time that you just have to kind of break free from it and sell it. But you have to learn to sell within your own system, whether it's short term or long term, just know when to sell. Much easier said than done. It's one of the most difficult things to do. It's the one thing I struggle with most to this day. I think it's the one thing most investors and traders still struggle with to this day. Um, follow your rules. So one, build your rules. But then once you build them, follow them. And if you have to tweak them along the way, tweak them. But don't tweak them too often. Make sure they're set in stone and you follow those rules. Have patience. I mean, things take time to develop. We're in a very instant world with social media and whether it be Twitter or Snapchat or TikTok, whatever it may be. Everything's just so instant nowadays. With Google searches. Have some patience. Things take time to work out. If you look at some of the best stocks of the last five years, a lot of them have some really volatile periods. But when you look back over five years, like, wow, why didn't I own this for five years? The stock's up 15x. Just have some patience if you have conviction in the stock. I prefer buying 52-week highs or near 52-week highs. Stay away from 52-week lows. It's just, it's just not the way I trade. Ignore all talking heads and the noise. And there's a lot of noise out there, whether it's on CNBC, whether it's on the radio, whether it's on uh, FinTwit. Just, just understand what you're doing. Understand what your time frame is. There are so many great traders out there. And there's so many great traders just in the last two days that you guys have highlighted. Some of them are very short term. They're not for me. They've got some tremendous information. There's a lot of stuff you can learn from those folks. and A lot of stuff that I've definitely have taken notes from. But, but also understand what's noise to what you're doing versus to what they're doing. So you may own stock. XYZ, they may own stock XYZ, they're selling today, but you're adding to it. One might be in a two-day time frame, might be, one might be in a two-year time frame. So just understand what your time frames are. Ignore the noise that doesn't apply to you. So I'm not saying it's all bad advice or it's all bad noise, but just understand what really kind of resonates with what you're trying to do and ignore the noise, um, but be acceptance or have acceptance of what others are doing so you can learn from them as well. Understand technical analysis. A lot of people like to call it voodoo and, 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 and charts don't really work. They're never going to tell you where a stock is going, but they're definitely going to tell you where a stock has been. And they're going to kind of give you indications of what's being accumulated and what's being uh, in a distribution phase. So understand technical analysis. It definitely can help you where to buy and ultimately where to sell as well. And then the last piece is control emotions. You want to be like a great head coach, great manager of a team where you kind of stay even keeled and steady throughout everything. Here as a trader and investor, you're... You're the student, you're the player, you're the coach, you're the manager, you're the GM, you're everything. And you have to control those emotions and you have to stay even keeled over time. I think this comes with age. Um, there's always exceptions. I think, Richard, with what you write and just talking to you and watch your interviews, you control your emotions a lot better than most people do in their 20s um, and, 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 and folks in their 30s, even 40s. But over time, in the last 20 years, I think I've controlled my emotions a little bit better. But there's still times where you get wrapped up in the overall uh, move of something really big when the market starts tanking and the market's going up really big and everyone's shooting out rocket emojis and this and that. And you just want to control your emotions and know what your plan is when you're investing in a certain stock or whatever it may be. Um, and that's it. And I think if you can do these 10 things and, and ultimately if you're working full time and you have a family and you're focusing elsewhere, if you can just spend a couple hours every week and kind of just really focus on your rules and your system, I think you're going to be successful over time. And with that, I'd say uh, thank you and certainly open to any questions that are out there. Chris, thank you so much. I just want to say this, this is really great, really fantastic. And up front from the comments I'm seeing, very relatable for a lot of people as well. So I want to thank you for that. And we've certainly got a bunch of great questions. Um, the first, uh, people were very curious about your LEAP strategy. So maybe you could talk about your experience with SoFi, how you planned that out and, and sure. yeah, your process with that. So what I do with the LEAP strategies, every once in a while, if, if there's a stock that's brand new, and I'm still unsure about if it's going to work out or not, rather than allocate, and I'm going to make up some numbers here, so don't go by these numbers. But let's just say, and again, I don't know where everyone is within their accounts, but let's say I want to put $10,000 with a stock, and I'm going to buy X number of shares for $10,000, but I'm not totally sure where it's going to go in the short term. Maybe the market's in a downtrend, and I don't want that much capital um, at risk at any given time. Sometimes I'll just sell a stock and say, all right, I can allocate maybe $3,000 of stock, control just as many shares if I buy options well out in the future. Now I'm gonna pay a premium for that. So there's, there's a fee I pay by buying that option, but I'm also putting a lot less capital at risk up front because um, I think the stock's gonna succeed long-term. Short-term options I think are a gamble because there's been a lot of times I've bought short-term options. I've been right on the actual play, but I've been wrong on the timing. And then you lose your money. Yeah. You lose the capital you put into it. Long-term options, if you have the conviction and you think the stock's gonna do 
what you've studied and that your due diligence says it's going to do, usually they're, they're going to work out over time. There's two plays to it. Either you can just capitalize on the appreciation of the actual leap option itself, or you can execute those shares in the future and buy those shares at that lower price. So, so far, if I have an execution price of 2250, if the stock's trading at 40 in the future, and I want to buy those shares. I can now go buy them at 2250. Um, now, when I bought that option, the stock was trading at 15. Some people say, well, why would you just buy and hold at 15? Well, I wasn't sure 15 was going to turn into seven. I just wasn't sure at that time. So I, I turned that more into an option strategy. The other time I use it every once in a while, and, and I should have did it on Fastly and I didn't do it. And I think it's going to have a good future going forward. I own the stock. I didn't sell the stock. Um, the stock has come down, I don't know, 50 some odd percent, 60 percent. When it came down, I wrote a tweet out and said, I actually, what I should do is just hold on to these shares, buy a bunch of leap options in the future. And then after 30 days, just sell these shares. So don't get knocked up in that uh, wash sale rule and then just get rid of it. And then just own the options at that point. Had I bought those options, I think they'd be up like 250% at this point from when I put that tweet out there. I've held the stock, the stock's up, I don't know, 30, 32, 35% at this point. Um, so that's another strategy. If you don't own a stock and it's some stock that you want to get into and it draws down big, you can always buy those leap options if you think they're going to go up in the future and not have a lot of capital at risk up front if you still think maybe there's still some further downside at that point in time. And you can always pyramid into a stock as well. I don't like the dollar cost average down. I do it sometimes, but it's not advisable in most cases. You can buy a couple options now, stock comes down a little bit further, buy a couple more options, and then you kind of build your position. And then over time, you can always sell some options and then actually execute some of those shares if you want to hold those shares for the long term. Um, so that, that, that's how I use that, that particular op, that strategy. Perfect. And I'm not an expert. I'm definitely not an expert yeah. in options, though. I'm not the guy to go to for options. It's something I'm still trying to test out. I have a good friend that I talk to that's offline, not on Twitter at all. He uses a lot of different options strategies. I'm trying to learn a little bit from him as far as how he hedges stuff and then how he actually buys into positions using some of these long term leap option strategies as well. Perfect. Um, and there are also some questions about uh, real estate since since people know you're involved with there. Uh, so they wanted to hear kind of your take on the real estate sector. And, and also, um, you didn't really talk about it in this presentation, but you also have plenty of investments in that area as well. Sure. So I, I slice and dice real estate into two compartments. You have residential real estate, and I get a lot of questions about Redfin and stocks along those lines. And what do I think? And my default response is I, I don't do anything in residential real estate. I've had some rental properties in residential real estate, but it's not what I do. I'm not a real estate agent. I don't deal with residential property. So it's hard for me to really comment on that. I can really just comment on what I just see in the market myself and, and where I live in New Jersey. And I think we're seeing this across the United States is houses are selling at record paces. Houses are selling for above ask price. And there's a little chat I was on last night. There's a, a couple of people that are on FinTwit and we we're talking about how the price is just getting crazy and folks are coming in and they're, they're voiding their inspections. They're, they're, they're putting hundred thousand dollars above ask without even sight on scene, stuff like that. The difference between now and the difference between 2006, seven, and eight is folks are coming with cash. Back then, they were buying properties with no money down and buying several properties with no money down. Nowadays, especially where I live here in this neighborhood, we're watching folks come in with 30, 40% cash on houses that are going well above ask. And, and they have to come down with cash because if you're buying a house that's worth, say, 500,000 and you're offering 600,000, when that piece of property appraises, the bank's not going to give you the mortgage for the 600,000. So you have to come with the difference in cash. So you're coming in the difference of cash above appraisal, and then you also come with the, maybe the 20% down the bank wants to see. So now you're literally putting 30% cash down in the house. So I don't think we're going to have the, the huge bust that we had back in 2008, where you're going to have all these houses going into foreclosure because people have a lot of cash now. And I think with, with uh, uh, the CARES Act and all the Fed printing right now, there's a lot of cash out there and people are looking to return on their money and people are looking to buy residences and and the money's there. Do I think the prices are appreciating far above what they should be? Yes. And I do think they'll pull back at some point. I don't think we're going to fall in the same hole we fell in 2008, just because I think there's a lot more equity in a lot of these properties at this point. On the commercial side, which is what I do for a living, we're talking to a lot of our clients and we have a, a tremendous amount of leading tech companies, a tremendous amount of these Fortune 500, 500 companies that we work with, as well as private companies. And we're trying to learn what they're doing going forward. Most of them are planning to bring staff back in the fall if they haven't already. And they're going to bring staff back at, at a limited rate. So maybe 50 or 60% of their staff. And they're going to do a hybrid. So maybe three days a week in the office, two days a week out of the office. I think they're going to try to figure out from September to December what's working, what's not working. And as they go into 2022, try to figure out, all right, if, if, if administrative, non-creative work can be done remotely, we're going to let our employees kind of work remotely, maybe one or two days a week indefinitely going forward. But in order for us to have a company culture, in order for us to do a lot of creative work, in order for us to innovate, we still need that office. But what does that office really look like? So I think commercial property is going to come back. I think a lot of landlords, especially in New York City, are giving a lot of incentives right now. So if you sign a seven or 10-year lease right now, a lot of landlords are giving you a year and a half free rent 
if you sign a commercial office pro, uh, space. So if your firm coming in looking for 50,000 square feet and you're going to sign a 10-year lease, that landlord might say, okay, I'm going to give you a $50 tenant improvement allowance. So $50 per square foot cash is yours. They'll build out whatever you want. And oh, by the way, I'm going to give you 12 months free rent or 18 months free rent. So I think the landlords are incentivized in a lot of these companies as we move out of 2021 into 2022 go out there and kind of re-up their leases or kind of look what they're going to do with their headquarters or their office space going forward. I think that market will come back, although it's going to be different. I don't know if we're going to see those massive headquarter campuses going forward in the future that, we, that yeah. we've seen in the past where maybe you have 5,000 or 10,000 employees in one location. You might see a lot of hubs. So you mm -hmm. might get a firm like a Google or an Amazon. They might have one or two East Coast, West Coast headquarters and then have a dozen other hubs throughout the country. And I think that's going to become more commonplace going forward. Office is definitely not going away. I think humans need to interact and be together in person overall. Um, it's just a matter of how flexible we're going to be going forward. And I think we're going to have that flexibility that we didn't have pre-COVID. Very interesting. And uh, we, we had a follow-up question about the leaps. How far out um, are you going and cover your strike price as well? Sure. So usually I go out um, at least one year. You want at least one year in the leap for the most part. Ideally, if you can get two years in the leap, you have to look at the premium. So there's, there's two ways to look at it. You could, you could buy a leap that's way out of the money or you can buy one that's in the money and, and you can calculate a different way the premiums go. Again, I'm not the expert here and I'm still learning myself. Um, I've done both. Um, yeah. More often than not, I'll buy a strike price that's above the current price. And so I'm paying less premium up front now, uh, but my risk reward is, is, is a little bit greater at that point. You can, you can buy leaps where you're actually in the money now um, and you're paying a much higher premium up front, but you have a much better chance to multiply your money over time or, Buy those shares at a much better price uh, should that stock appreciate in the future. So me personally, I'm, I'm looking for stocks like SoFi. Like I said, I was trading around 15 at the time. I bought a $22 and a half uh, leap option about a year out or so. Mm -hmm. And it's for next January in 2022. I'm just hoping that at any given time, that stock's trading at 40, 40 plus dollars per share at that point. And I'll either execute those shares or just take the money off the table with the option. Perfect. Uh, well, I think we'll end it there and, and head over to lunch. Chris, thank you so much. Really excellent and well put together presentation that I think helped out a lot of people. So thank you again. Oh, actually, one last thing. Uh, people are asking what that Van Tharp uh, book you were referring to was. I don't know if it was on your list uh, yeah, that you sure. shared. Let me, um, let me just see if I can go back. Did I have it on the list? I did not have it on the list here. I'll post a tweet up about it. But sure. it's, uh, Perfect. Um, give me one second. Look back. It's uh, Trade for Financial Freedom. I'll, I'll put it up on Twitter, Richard, okay. or what it is. But it's... Uh, Trade Your Way to Financial Freedom, I believe, is the is the latest title. And there's a couple different editions, but I'll put the latest one out there from uh, Dr. Van K. Tharp, T-H-A-R-P. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, all right, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in to the first half of day day two. And uh, we'll come back at uh, 1.30 with Arusha Paris. And it should be a great end to the, to the conference. So thank you, guys. And uh, yeah, relax, take some break, get some food, um, and come back refreshed with a fresh notebook. Um, and be ready to take a lot of notes because we got a great end to this day. So thank you and see you guys at thank you at 1:30. And thanks, Chris. Take care, Richard. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.